This speaker somehow has never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I commend, I don't know, I love peanut butter and jelly, so I don't commend it, but I'm, I commend someone to make it their whole life without having that. So please, everyone welcome Megan. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be here and be kicking us off this morning, with the speaker section of the conference. So my name is Megan Robertson. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about creating produ production level data science code. So I am currently a senior data scientist at Nike. Um, to answer one of the most common questions about that, yes, I do own a lot of shoes. Um, no, I don't always get them for free. Um, I've been working in data science for about three and a half years now and joined the field after I finished my master's degree in statistics. So today's talk is going to be focusing on a lot of the tips and tricks I've learned while working in industry to take something from a proof of concept model into a production job. So a quick overview of where this talk is going. So starting out with an introduction, welcome, that's where you are now, and then gonna define what I mean when I say production code or jobs. Then we'll transition to what I call breaking it down. So how do you take something from when you have it in this proof of concept model or proof of concept idea that works, gets approved, and organize it so it's easier to get it into that production form. Then we'll move into some strategies on how to actually tackle writing that code, updating what you have for that proof of concept, getting into production. And then last, just a quick summary of what I think are some of the most important things that I want you all to take away from today. So one quick thing to call out is this, um, Kind of the dirty little secret of my presentation is I actually tend to do a lot more of my work in Python. This presentation isn't necessarily R specific. Um, so if you are looking for R specific resources about packages, different functions that exist already to put your R code in production, highly recommend this website here, put rimprod.com. Don't worry, you'll still get a lot out of my talk today, but it's more of a general coding strategy as opposed to something that's language specific. So let's start out uh, by talking about what is it when, what do I mean when I say job? So here when I'm talking about production code throughout this talk, job is gonna be the term I use for production code. I might use them interchangeably, but for the sake of defining it, a job, <clears throat> excuse me, is just a piece of code written to complete a particular task that runs at a regularly scheduled interval. And again, this is something um, that I'm gonna be using interchangeably when I say production code. So for example, if, so refresh data on a dashboard, I'd have code that would just kick off at a certain time of day, run without me having to, um, having to go through and run things manually at all. So, I wanted to then introduce the simple use case. Again, this talk is gonna be a lot of general tips and strategies that I use when I'm moving code from that proof of concept into a production environment, but wanted to introduce a use case so we could have a little bit of more concrete examples to think about to make some of those strategies um, a little clearer. So let's say for the next 10 to 15 minutes I have left, we're all data scientists at a health insurance company and we've built a model to predict member claims each month. The company has a special program. You get a Fitbit, a Fitbit, you log your diet information. That's the data that we're using. And we're using that to predict whether a claim is going to be made. And we also want to have in our job a summary of the model and performance. One, so the data science team can see if the model performance is changing over time, but or um, we also want something so our stakeholders can understand what aspects of our data, what variables are really influencing how the model makes predictions. So now let's talk about what I call breaking it down. So how you take what you've made for that proof of concept, which a lot of times can be a ton of different code. Some things worked, some different. They might be across different notebooks, kind of different scripts all over the place. 
How can you think about breaking that down into more digestible pieces for you to tackle to turning into a production code? Um, and I always do that by starting out and with identifying these smaller steps. So here are three buckets that I'll basically consider for every single data science project that I do. These buckets can also have like smaller groups within them. Every project might not fit into these. You might need to add more of your own, but the idea is you want to sort the code that you've already written into each of these buckets. So for example, like I always, the first one is data and feature updates. So beginning of a data science project, you're doing a lot of data cleaning, investigating outliers, missing data. In our case, we have diet and Fitbit information coming to us, but we that gives us data on like a daily level. We need to aggregate it to the monthly. That's stuff that would happen in this phase. So examples of code that I would put into this bucket include joining together fitness data with member demographics, uh, a way to identify any bugs that I had to do, aggregating those measures so we can get it to that monthly level. The second bucket I'll usually consider is what code did I use to develop the model or run whatever algorithm it is that I'm using. So for example, let's say in our use case, we wanna refit update the parameters of our model every two months, that code goes into this bucket. We wanna predict which customers will make a claim. That also goes into this bucket as well as saving those model outputs. And then the final bucket is some sort of sharing or automated reporting. Again, not every project will necessarily have this. Sometimes you just make predictions, save them internally for the data science team to use. But in our case, we our relevant teams wanna know more information about the variables in our model that are um, really related to the probability of whether someone is making a claim, as well as having that summary performance report for the data science team. So again, here, this is really just about making the task of converting from that proof of concept code to the production code more manageable because now when I've sorted all of my code into these buckets, I can go to the beginning and start the process of converting that proof of concept code into something ready for production, which will be um, what I'm getting to next. And I just want to say too that for me, when I'm starting a project, I'll try to keep in mind these different buckets here and organize my code. so. Um, my, a lot of my experience, I've worked on teams where using Databricks or Jupyter notebook type environment as opposed to just writing scripts. So I'll make a notebook for data cleaning. I'll make a notebook for the model because then I can think about how I order those from that proof of concept when I'm turning it into something in production. So now that we've broken down that code and, and organized it into something that can be a bit more digestible, let's talk about how you actually tackle that proof of concept code and get it to the point where it can be something used in a regularly recurring job. So the first thing I always like to do are define parameters. So a parameter is just gonna be information that you're providing as input to the code. So you can see here, I've got two snippets of R code. The top one, we're just making a density plot and ggplot to display um, the claim probability predicted from the model on a certain day. So circled in red there, you can see that there are two dates hard-coded, which is great if I'm just doing this as my proof of concept, making some plots, but if I want this plot to be part of my job, that's a regularly recurring image that's saved, I don't wanna have to go through every week and go and change all of those hard-coded dates. So that's a great, op that's an opportunity for me to define a parameter. You can see in that second snippet of code is where it's now changed to remove those hard dates. And you can see that second line there under loading the library, we have a call to date equals sys.date. So that'll just pull the date that it's being run that the model was predicting for and make it, um, use it to filter the data and into the title of that plot. So I like to go through all of my notebooks as this is one of the first things I like to do. At the top, I'll usually put a cell for all of my parameters. How you change those parameters or set them will depend on what sort of scheduler you use. So here, obviously, this is an example where the date, we can just use system's date currently. That might not always be the case. You might have to set up a way to like, for example, 
Another parameter you might have is if you're fitting a type of model and one of the arguments is to use a certain loss function, that's something you'd have to define and change. Um, but again, parameters give you a way to easily update your code so that you don't have to go through and change, like go through every line and change it for every run that you do. Another thing that I'll always do when I'm writing production code, and this is, um, I tend to do it a lot more in those data feature generation stages, but this is something that you should be doing throughout, are quality insurance checks, which are ways to discover anomalies and consistencies in your data output. So especially when I was an undergrad in grad school, I kind of operated under the model of if it runs without errors, then everything's fine and dandy, uh, which as you know, is not a great way to do it. And I would get to a point where, you know, we're fitting model and everything is null or everything is zero. And it can be a lot to work back to figure out what the issue is. So these three areas are, I'll put what I call quality assurance checks into a production code. The next slide, I'll go over a concrete example of what that could look like in R. But this is checking for things like null values or outliers, empty tables, if people are duplicated in our data where they shouldn't be. And this is really helpful, especially if you're using data that's coming from a lot of different res resources, data pipelines break, things show up that look weird. Maybe for some reason someone's Fitbit dies, we have no data on them, or it goes haywire and it says they're running 10 million miles a day. I wanna know about those things ahead of time before I get to a point where my job is fitting that model and then putting it in some sort of summary output that's going to a stakeholder and they're seeing all of these wonky results. I wanna catch that. Um, so those quality assurance checks are a great way to do that. So what that would look like in our code, let's say here's just another simple code snippet. We're combining a table that is unique on user ID, two tables unique on user ID, one has information about their gross, the user's grocery and diet. Another has that Fitbit information to measure exercise aggregated at the monthly level. Here, I'm just gonna check for duplicates because I wanna make sure when I'm fitting that monthly model that each person is only appearing once. So here you can see that line total equals N row. That's just giving us how many rows are in our data. The next line, unique ID, is just giving us the number of unique users. So this is saying a simple conditional to check if the number of rows in our data set is not equal to the number of unique IDs, we wanna exit because that's gonna be an issue. We know this data should be unique on that user ID. Um, and in a couple slides, I'm gonna talk about log files and a little bit more about information you can include in this conditional to help you debug. But again, this is just a simple example of one of these quality assurance checks. And I like to start with those three areas I highlighted on the previous slide, but you can also add more things that are specific to your project, or I've had times where I've gone through a production code job, get a weird error, or it fails, and I don't really know why, finally figure it out, and it'll inspire me to add different checks that are a result of that error. Another thing that's super important for when you're taking, um, when you're making something to a production job, and this is even something that you should be doing when you're writing that proof of concept code, is commenting. So I've only got 20 minutes a day, could do a whole other presentation on commenting, so I'll just give you the short and sweet version of it. But commenting is always necessary. You wanna be adding these short lines of explanatory text to your code so that um, if you, come revisit it, you know what's happening. Um, I've definitely been in places where you, I've got 20 stack overflow, tabs open, trying to figure out how to make something work. You're copying, you're pasting, and then you come back a few days later and you don't know what's going on. Adding comments um, will help you kind of remember what you did. It'll also, you want your code, especially at the production level, for other people on your team to be able to go in and understand what's happening. That way, if you're on vacation and something fails, they're not pinging you to come and fix it. They can kind of go in and figure it out themselves. Like I said, this a lot of people have a lot of thoughts on writing comments. 
Um, I recommend if you to look up different style guides. So a bunch of companies out there have their own recommended style guides for coding about or for commenting about what to include, how long they should be, all that sort of thing. So if you kind of want to have a more uniform way to how you comment, definitely look up those style guides. And lastly, I'll just say definitely comment as you code. You don't want to be in the, the situation where you finish and then everything you have to come back and code after the fact is a lot easier to remember what you were doing as you were doing it. Also on what I think of as the communication front of writing production job is the, a log file. So this is a file that you store meaningful code output throughout a job. You can see here on the right an example of what a log file looks like. It's got some timestamps in there. It's printing warnings and errors. And say you make your production code, your job, it's running, and then all of a sudden one day it stops, it fails. Your log file is going to be one of the first, is going to be the first place that you go to figure out what's happening here. So you want to think about what are the important information that I would want to know when I'm debugging since you're not there to run that code. You weren't there running that code line by line and seeing the output in real time. So things I always like to include are timestamps. So I know when things are starting, finishing, I'll usually throw a timestamp on like after the feature generation, when I'm starting the model fit, when I'm ending the model fit, just so you can see if there's things are hanging up, taking longer, taking less time than they usually do. Uh, versions for things. So if you're using, um, a shared like cloud computing environment and maybe something happens, there's an automatic update, it updates the R version, packages get changed. You'll wanna know what versions were being run in your job. Warnings, errors are always helpful because um, that can alert you to the, at least the part of the code that's going wrong. I also like to include data summaries. So in our example, that would be just something like a simple summary on the different columns of the table going into our model fit because then I can look over time to see is our group of customers changing um, and just kind of track that over time is great. And then also I like to include quality assurance checks so that what I talked about on those previous slides are great to have. If I'm exiting my job because it failed one of those QA checks, I'll add a print statement so I know which one it is and that helps me hone down on the areas to um, start looking for the issue. So last thing I'll mention um, before getting to the summary, uh, a big part of tackling the code is doing code review. So code review is just your peers are checking over what you're writing at a regular interval or as changes are made. This is another topic that could definitely cover its, be its own presentation as well. But code review is great because it gives you a sense of team responsibility. So again, I go on vacation, I want someone, I want my team to know or someone else to know what's happening in this job and really understand it. Um, it's also a learning opportunity. So say I develop this proof of concept model by myself, but I then need, as I'm taking that proof of concept code into production, I'm going to send my teammates small chunks of code as I turn into that production to look over. They're looking at it to see if there are any errors that they find, um, any suggestions, any bit of feedback. So they're learning about what I did on a more detailed level, which is great, again, because that contributes to that shared responsibility. And it's also a great learning opportunity for um, the person who's writing the code. So especially earlier on in my career, I had a lot of time for code review. My more senior peers would look at it and they would say, well, okay, what you did here works. It's right, it'll run, nothing's wrong, but like here's a much cleaner way to do it using this function or this package. Um, so it's also great to learn new things. And here I just have the GitHub logo as a quick shout out. Um, GitHub is a, method of version control. So I imagine if you work in industry, you've probably heard of GitHub. Um, maybe if you're a student, you're not as familiar with it, but that's the tool used most often for version control and code review. So if you're not familiar, highly recommend kind of look, we're learning about um, 
pull requests, merging, approval, that whole process. So in conclusion, um, a few key things that if you take away anything from this presentation, I'd like you to take away. One, tackle your production code in smaller pieces. So think about how you can organize it in a way that's a bit more digestible. Some production jobs are gonna be a lot more complicated than others, and it can be easy to get a little bit disorganized, overwhelmed. So think about what are the big steps of your project? How do they fit into those three buckets and what order makes sense for them to then be converting that proof of concept code into production? Always be thinking about communication. So this is where things like commenting, the log files come into play. You, if you never want only one person to be the only person who understands some of your jobs that are in production, people go on vacation, people transition into new roles at different companies. You wanna make sure that you have that written communication there so that someone else can come in and understand what's going on. And then lastly, make sure that, don't be afraid to take a step back. So again, it can be really overwhelming, especially if you've had to try a lot of things for the, to get that proof of concept approved. Um, I'm a very visual person, so when I feel overwhelmed coding, I'll literally go to a whiteboard and just draw boxes and arrows of what I think the different steps of a job are. And that really helps me kind of get organized as opposed to sitting there banging my head against my desk, kind of trying to figure out errors or figure out what's happening. Um, and with that, um, I think we might have started a little late, so we might not have time for questions, but here you can see that's my Twitter handle, um, my website there as well. I've got a form that you can fill out and send any questions that you have for me. Um, and thanks for spending some time with me this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great kickoff to the conference. Uh, thank you for uh, being that first person. I hope everyone had a great first video. Uh, I know we're just starting to get rolling.